cracking. Big dogs. Welcome. Bike to the channel. Welcome, bike to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs. Gotta eat. More rookie chirp today. Five rookies in Dynasty that you need to let your idiot league mates draft. Let them come and go. They are simply water passing you by. For you meditators out there, you know, you're looking above the highway, you're seeing the cars fly by. You don't have to react to it. Just because this player has gotten hype and you're on the clock does not mean you need to draft them, okay? We're here to make sure that you let these five rookies get drafted by your idiot league mates. I'm ready to run this bit. Y'all are ready. Wherever you are, I don't care if you're watching via your TV on your couch or you're on the subway right now watching on your phone or if you're listening via podcast mowing your lawn. Stop what you're doing. Tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling and let us eat. So this video format was one of, if not the most popular video that we did last summer, as it refers to redraft leagues and season long leagues, right? Like just five players, let your idiot league mates draft. And I want to say of this five or six players we put on the list, I, I want to say we had a hundred percent hit rate. So I'm feeling good about this. I feel like it's pretty easy to know who to avoid. And that's even easier in rookie drafts because the hype gets out of control and we have all the data right in front of us. Okay. So it's very obvious to me that the players on this list are fades given how much the dynasty community loves them. It is a little bit difficult just because in rookie drafts, I mean, there's the first two rounds are, I mean, if you're someone who's as deep into the rookie class as like I am or whatever, and you got a bunch of third, fourth round picks, it's exciting no matter what part of the fucking rookie draft you're at because you think you're finding gold in like that at the 409 when, you know, plot twist, you're not. But it's still, you know, it's exciting nonetheless. But for typically like it's hard to tell you to fade guys because there's only the first two rounds are like the only guys who are like really projected to be good fantasy players right so i'm sitting here like don't draft the guy who's going at the 307 and it's like the tweet where it's like no one me telling you to do that and it's like no one was drafted there's a reason he's going at the fucking 307 in a rookie draft which means he's probably like the 1502 in a startup draft I'm not sure why I'm rambling about this, but what I'm going to try to do is my best to combine a player's value, their current ADP, and just the overall hype around them and how well known they are in terms of just like name value and guys that are easily off my list. All right. First up is Kyron Williams running back out of Notre Dame. Let somebody else draft this dude, please. The first thing I want to start off with is that like this needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed multiple fucking times there needs to be 75 letters sent to this address all right we're gonna pull up a tweet from daniel jeremiah and, and then we're gonna pull it back and then we're gonna tell a story of mr kyron williams and why we dislike him so much daniel jeremiah tweets out pro day lesson be careful taking the twitter reported times as gospel a lot of these times come from agents and the school i see it every day scout at the pro day texts me 4.70 then i see tweets everywhere saying 455 jim nagy follows up he said had the same text from three different scouts last week we never post any times unless it's from trusted scouts actually standing there on the 40 and then i tweeted some stuff out about this as well and anytime you start tweeting shit where it like hurts people's feelings you know those those are the most valuable tweets but they get like four likes because everyone's like ah, you not me talking about me you fucking right i'm talking about you if the shoe fits all right like y'all can do whatever you want when it comes to the testing and the combine numbers and the scouting and that shit. But I couldn't imagine when we literally have the combine numbers at our fingertips, right? The, the NFL organizes an event where every single running back goes to the same exact field at the same exact time with official lasered time 40s and runs it. So we know exactly where this guy is at athletically relative to everybody else in the class. But people want to wait for like some fake beat reporter to report a time for a guy that they like as wildly unofficial. But y'all take that as gospel. The stuff from the pro days are so fucking wildly unverifiable. Because like Daniel Jeremiah said, it comes from the schools, it comes from the scouts, and it comes from people that know the player and are around the player. All three of those options have the best interest in mind of getting the player more hyped up and higher drafted in the NFL draft. Please do not take pro day times if there are combine times. It is the dumbest fucking way to look at a prospect. Like the fucking dumbest. And we saw it. Kyron Williams was the perfect example. He shows up to the combine. 
195194. So you're already talking about an undersized guy who has a very very high hill to climb in order to be anything more than a role player at the next level. 194 pounds, that shit just doesn't happen. Runs a 465. So he's small and he's slow. Then the pro day happens and people start tweeting out 453. He's fucking back, baby. And then the official time comes out like a day or two later that he ran like a 471. He was even slower, okay? So don't believe the bullshit that's posted from the pro days. It's just a ridiculously toxic way to go about thinking about prospects, all right? So you're looking at Kyron Williams, who people liked. I, I was unimpressed when I watched him the first time he played back in 2020. 2021, I thought he improved as a runner. He's a great pass catcher. I think that's going to be his role at the next level. But this dude, realistically is less athletic than fucking Snacks is. I don't know if you've ever seen the combine that we do with the Fade the Public, me, Animal, and Snacks compete against each other. Snacks literally cannot run a 40-yard dash without falling down. And then I think he did the combine with John Boy Media a couple weeks ago and literally fell down when he was doing it again, right? Fucking, it's bad. And now you have a 194-pound player that's not going to be used on three downs. Barely probably used on two downs, man. But people will be out there telling you that his fucking contact balance is fire, though. All right. Like it's the dumbest shit, man. People are so cringy on Twitter. Kyron Williams is such an easy fade right now. According to player profiler, his ADP is at the 202. So fucking far over drafted. You're drafting basically a way less athletic version of Kenny Gainwell, who was drafted later than Kyron. So you're drafting a less athletic Kenny Gainwell earlier than you drafted Kenny Gainwell in a class that has way more athletic backs relative to the one that Kenny Gainwell just came out of. Man, let someone else grab Kyron Williams anywhere near this 202 ADP. Next up is a quarterback for my super flexors out there. Any dynasty content, rookie content I refer to going forward will always be in reference to super flex drafts, all right? So you knew we couldn't miss out on some QB love here, and that is Mr. Carson Strong out of Nevada. Now, I'm kind of upset because he was, all these guys on this list were guys that I did not like months ago when I watched their tape and then the combine kind of verified what I did not like about them or just people's opinions of them have kind of shaped and formed towards the way I felt about them earlier on in the process. Carson Strong was a guy who like people were talking about end of first round of rookie drafts, early second round. And for that, even even that for me is way too early. Right now, his ADP is 204. He's the QB5 off the board. I'm not really going to argue against the quarterback ranking in terms of where he is, though I think he's probably the QB6 without a doubt. It's uh, Malik Willis, you know, some combination of Kenny Pickett, Matt Corral, Sam Howell. I would put Desmond Ritter ahead of Carson Strong. So I'd put Carson Strong easily as a QB6 right now, obviously, depending on draft capital. I just think Strong just, he just ain't it, man. I think there's no chance he goes in round one. I think there's maybe a chance he goes in round two if some team really likes him. But most mock drafts I've seen, like NFL actual mock drafts, have him in round three or later. The way I look at Carson Strong is he's like a Jimmy G reenactment. And the only reason Jimmy G is even useful whatsoever in fantasy is because he's in the perfect system with the perfect players to capitalize on him just dumping the ball off. Are we going to have a problem? And that's what I see about Carson Strong, man. He is, he's got a strong arm, but he takes exactly what he gets in the offense. Like he is so, so happy to check down to running backs, to check down to screen wide receivers, to just check down over the middle. He is not a guy who attempts it down the field, man. He's and and I don't blame him because it's it's like a fucking measuring tape, bro. Like once it gets past 10, 15 yards, shit starts to get floppy. That's the way I look at Carson Strong. He had a a dot, an average depth of target, right? Like how far his average throw went downfield of eight yards. In 2021, that ranked 120th of 146 qualified NCAA quarterbacks, which is basically what backed up my eyeballs. That's what I saw on film. I was like, he just loved to take the dump offs. His 14.2% deep ball attempt rate ranked 99th. Okay. So that wasn't much better either. His passer grade while under pressure, according to PFF, 45.6, which ranked 91st among quarterbacks. The drop off in grade from a clean pocket with no pressure to a pocket under pressure was massive. It was like one of top five in the NCAA. He just simply wasn't a playmaker when he was under pressure, right? And a lot of the times these rookie quarterbacks go into situations where they're going to be under pressure a lot, all right? His big time throw rate, which is basically uh, these guys watching film and telling you how many pinpoint throws they had down the field. I think it's over 20 yards down the field, you know, in good, perfect, like passing lanes or whatever, or tight throws, money throws, whatever. 1.6% was bottom 10 in the NCAA among like 150 qualified quarterbacks. He's not a runner either. Barring first round draft capital, Strong should not be taken anywhere near the beginning of second rounds in Superflex rookie drafts. That is for damn sure. So draft capital is going to be a decider for me just because if any quarterback gets strong draft capital, I am 
willing to admit that I could be very wrong about them. And the upside of drafting a quarterback anywhere outside of the first round in rookie drafts is very, very high. But Strong will need the draft capital. He is someone I have no interest in from a pure quarterback fantasy perspective. Same with Wandell Robinson, wide receiver out of Kentucky. I know this is going to hurt some feelings out there. Currently going off the board at the 211, the wide receiver nine. I couldn't imagine having him as top nine wide receiver in this in this very strong, deep class. 5'8", 178. Concern number one, all right? He's, I don't know, he's like a shot of tequila at 2.30 a.m. At, at some point, you just have to say no. You think there's this like crazy upside to it. You think it might give you an advantage. You think it might lead to something great. And that's what continues to happen with rookie drafters, with these guys that are extremely, extremely undersized, all right? And it ends in misery every time. It's never a good idea. 5'8", 178, just say no. All right, we're going to call Wandell. We're actually going to change his name. Just thought this off the top of my head. Just say no, Dare, the Dare program growing up. So we're going to start calling him Juan Dare Robbins. All right, D-A-R-E. Who out there has that swaggy t-shirt that Dare uh, that Dare used to give out that probably sells for like $92 on Etsy now? Juan Dare Robinson. When I look at his profile, there are a lot of good things about it, right? You look at the breakout age, you look at the college target share, you look at the college dominator. They're all very, very very, very up there in terms of like percentile ranking amongst other wide receivers. And you like to see that. But there is no difference between his profile and Rondell Moore when it comes to those things, but he's way less athletic. His weight adjusted speed score in the 23rd percentile. So it's great that he ran a 4-4-4, but at 5'8", 178, you better be fucking running a 4-4-4. Otherwise, you have no chance of getting onto the field. His burst score, 31st percentile. Again, this is something that I have been relaying to you guys all offseason that no one talks about, but that college yards per reception number in the 24th percentile is a huge red flag when you have all these other green flags around it. What it tells me, and this, again, makes perfect sense when looking at the offense, Kentucky, they don't have playmakers, all right? They don't have playmakers on the outside. Thus, you force the ball to a guy like Wondell Robinson, who is definitely going to be the best athletic, the most athletic, best wide receiver on your team thus pumping up the college target share, thus pumping up the college dominator rating. But the yards per reception number at a low rate tells me that he's not doing as much when the ball is actually in his hands as other players would be that are probably better at football. And I compare him to uh, Rondell Moore. Again, Rondell Moore, way, way more athletic. And a lot of you guys are going to be like, if Arizona just used him correctly. Like, when are you idiots going to understand that guys that size don't get used correctly? All right? It's not the coaches. It's on you to realize that the coaches aren't going to do that. And that is a very, very obvious fact. Lord! And again, he's not even Rondell Moore. He's way less explosive. He's he's slower. Uh, he weighs less. Like, all that shit, all right? I at least have confidence that if Rondell Moore does get the chance to play wide receiver in the NFL rather than just a weapon, he would be good. I don't have that confidence with Wondell Robinson. So, Kentucky, Wondell Robinson, second round, absolutely motherfucking not. We got a few other names on this list, and I was kind of deciding between whether or not I wanted to throw him on here. Tyler Algier. Running back at a BYU, he was a guy that I've been way lower on than consensus throughout this entire process. Then he comes in, has a pretty shitty combine, and then everyone starts agreeing with the take I originally had, which was sexy to see. His ADP currently is 302, RB8, okay? So he's not going to be my RB8 in this class, but like the 302 is somewhere that I probably actually would pull the trigger on Algier. I do think there are going to be people in your rookie draft that do look to take him at the end of the second round, which is where you're letting somebody else take that bullet. Right now, according to ADP, He is going ahead of Zamir White, Christian Watson, Jalen Tolbert, and that is a big fucking nope from your boy, okay? Look at the profile, and he has a lot of good on his profile. You know, his size, the fact that he caught 28 passes his final year of school, his overall production is really, really impressive. Now, his size isn't going anywhere, but again, a lot of the production, like I've been relaying for months, came from the fact that you play at BYU, okay? So you're playing against really, really shitty competition. And BYU had a really, really, really highly ranked offensive line, right? Like literally number four in the entire NCAA two years ago. I think number eight or nine this previous year. So you have an offensive line that's objectively grading out as one of the best in the NCAA versus teams that are horrible. That's what happens when you play at BYU. I actually want to go over a list of some of the teams that Algier played against over the last two years. Navy, Troy, Louisiana Tech, Texas, San Antonio, Texas State. It's amazing that he can play all these Texas teams and not one fucking relevant one. North Alabama, Coastal Carolina, South Florida, Washington State, Idaho State, fucking Idaho State, Georgia Southern, Alabama, Birmingham. Like, most of these teams sound like they're made up. I don't even know if they're real. There's probably not a single NFL player rostered on 
any of those fucking teams, all right? It's just such an easy formula for me to see. A lot of his production in college came off these big runs that just aren't going to be replicatable because he's not going to he's not going to have that offensive line. He's not going to have those holes. He's not going to be playing against fucking Idaho State and he runs a 4640, okay? So those are gone. All right. His pass catching, sure. 28 receptions, good, right? Objectively good. I don't think he's a phenomenal pass catcher, but he shows that he can do it at least at the next level. He's just a big, unathletic back, realistically. Um, and what's more concerning is what I'd call the burst metrics, okay? So you can be like, have his profile. But what I need to see is that you have good burst so that you could turn those little holes of four yard plays into eight yard plays and 12 yard plays, very similar to guys of like Damian Harris's stature, where the burst score is there. And that tells me that you don't need to hit home runs. And with Algier, I was starting, I started to look at some of the advanced analytics, you know, uh, thanks to Sports Info Solutions, SIS. Love you. Only 14.5% of his carries went for 10 or more yards, which was 77th in the NCAA. Only 7.3% of his carries went for 15 plus yards, 76th in the NCAA. Mediocre. So you're looking at the, you hear those numbers and basically only half the carries that he took for 10 or more yards also went for 15 or more yards. All right. He can't get deep into the secondary. That's what happens when you lack elusiveness and burst. So Tyler Algeal fears like a, just a thumper at the next level. A lot of these running backs feel like they're, they're two down guys. They're thumpers at the next level. Those guys have upside in fantasy if they end up in a really good offense with a really good offensive line, right? Any of these guys can hit if those are the circumstances, which is the case for a lot of guys, but a lot of other guys can actually make things happen for themselves, which I don't really see Tyler Algier doing. Next up on this list is James Cook, the running back out of Georgia. Yes, this is Dalvin Cook's little brother. And that's a big reason why I think you need to be very weary of taking James Cook, okay? James Cook is going to get a lot of hype leading up to the NFL draft. People are going to see James Cook and they're going to think of two things, all right? They're going to think one of that playoff semifinal game against Michigan that was on live TV and everybody watched. He went six for 32 on the ground, four for 112, and he touched down through the air. That's what people are going to remember. I remember personally watching it and being like, yo, this kid's pretty fucking good. That was only Cook's second game the entire year with over 100 in total yards from scrimmage. Outside of that game, he averaged 12 receiving yards per game. Look, James Cook is an undersized guy. He is sub 200 pounds. He is small. His BMI is really, really small because he's like 5'11", but 190 something pounds. So he does not fit the frame of a three down back. He's not going to be a three down back. Uh, the college has already told you that. His single game high in carries in the 40 years that he was at Georgia, 2018, 11, 2019, 6, 2020, 7, 2021, 12. Those are his single game highs in carries in college. If you think for some fucking reason a team is going to take him and then say, we're going to give him more carries per game than he got in college, you're out of your fucking mind. This man saw this man played 46 games at Georgia and never once saw more than 12 carries in a game. All right. Like, I get it. You, you did. I did. We saw him play on TV and it looked fun. He's not a workhorse. He never will be. Again, his BMI in the ninth percentile. He is sub 200 pounds. Is he a really good pass catcher? Yes. Can he be that at the next level? Sure. Is he explosive? He is. Those guys rarely hit in fantasy with any sort of upside. Very, very, very rarely are you ever going to use them outside of like a weekly flex consideration. That might be what Cook's end, end game could be in rookie drafts. Uh, right now, he's currently going at the 32nd spot overall at the 308. I don't think that's like terrible, but I also think he's going to go way higher than that in rookie drafts. I, I see him where like Tal Tyler Algier's ADP is at like the 302. I see him creeping up and, you know, anything in the first half of the third round, back end of the second round, you're letting an idiot league mate draft. Again, he's Dalvin Cook's brother. He ain't Dalvin Cook. That is for sure. I would much rather prefer going with more higher upside guys who have the size, athleticism, production, the analytics tell you that he's good in terms of like advanced stuff, long speed, like the Kevin Harris, Damian Pierce, those guys I would take over James Cook 55 out of 10 times. All right. So that is today's video. Five rookies to let your idiot league mates draft in your dynasty rookie drafts upcoming right after the NFL draft typically happens. If you enjoy this video, one, obviously hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, but let me know if you want me to do a part two, because I was thinking about doing a part two. I, I, I wrote down some like honorable mentions. I was like, I can make a whole ass feature film out of just this topic. These are fun to do because I get to just shit on. People, all right. And I got plenty more rookies to shit on. We shitting on them. That's it. All right. Love you. Bye.